The phrase comes from, or at least is much popularised by, a theology, covenant theology to be precise, which this past 450 years or more has detrimentally coloured the way many believers read and understand scripture. While covenant theologians talk, as scripture does, about the old and new covenants, alas, they mean something quite different to the Bible. They have invented a system which postulates a covenant which they call the covenant of grace, a phrase unknown in scripture. And since the Bible has a great deal to say about covenants, this invention grievously imposes a man-made construct on a vital scriptural principle, and thus clouds it dreadfully. Covenant theologians allege that their invented overarching covenant, the covenant of grace, has been revealed in two different administrations, the Old Covenant in the Old Testament and the New Covenant in the New Testament. In essence, covenant theologians allege these two covenants are the same, just different administrations of their one covenant of grace. Furthermore, those covenant theologians who hold to infant baptism, and that's the majority, try to use their system to support their practice by contending that the church is the same in both testaments. From this assertion, they argue that what circumcision was in the Old Testament, baptism is in the New. Baptism, they say, has replaced circumcision. That being so, they go on to argue that since infants were circumcised in, as they put it, the Old Testament church, that is, the Jewish church, infants ought to be baptized Sprinkled is what they really mean in the New Testament church, that is, the gospel church. Hence the phrase I am objecting to, a gospel church, is one which is based on a faulty theology and consequently one which carries massive overtones, unscriptural overtones, not least infant baptism. We are not talking about a phrase which is innocent, harmless, far from it. Let me show that covenant theologians do indeed talk in terms of the Jewish church, meaning Israel, and a gospel church, meaning believers, in the days of the new covenant. We could perhaps start with John Owen and his The True Nature of a Gospel Church. In addition to a gospel church, the following extract is full of other covenant theology speak. This is what Owen stated right at the start of his book. There is no other sort of visible church of Christ organized, that's covenant theology speak, but a particular church or congregation, either in the Old or New Testament, where all the members thereof do ordinarily meet together in one place to hold communion one with another in some one or more great ordinances of Christ. I break him. How, when, and where did Israel meet together in one place to hold communion one with another in some one or more great ordinances of Christ? Would some covenant theologian give me a scriptural reference for it? Considering the descendants of Abraham, who would eventually become the nation of Israel, Owen, without batting an eyelid, declared, after the descent of a numerous progeny from Abraham's loins, God takes them to himself in one visible body, a national but congregational church, into which he forms them 430 years after the promise. In the wilderness, that is, at Sinai, with God's giving of the law and the establishment of the old covenant for Israel by the hand of Moses. And although all Abraham's natural posterity, according to the external part of the promise made to him, were taken into visible church fellowship, so that it became a national church, yet it was such a national church always, in the wilderness and in the promised land. They were always bound to assemble at the tabernacle or temple, thrice at least every year. Hence the tabernacle was still called the tabernacle of the congregation. With the coming of the Messiah, his finished work, ascension and outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Old Covenant was fulfilled and rendered obsolete, and the New Covenant was brought in. This is what Scripture teaches. Owen, however, expressed this in terms of his covenant theology. 
when Christ had divorced this people, that is Israel, the Jewish church, abolished their mosaical constitution, he erects his gospel church, calls in disciples by his ministry, forms them into a body, furnishes them with officers and ordinances, and after he had suffered, rose again, and continued here forty days. And so Owen went on. When referring to the ministry of Haggai to the Jews after the return of Judah from Babylonian captivity and during their rebuilding of the temple, Owen confused confusion even more when he spoke of the great discouragements laid before the Jews by the adversaries of Judah, when they find the children of the spiritual captivity are about to build a gospel church unto the Lord. Staggering. While there is no question but that Owen was a great theologian, these extracts clearly illustrate the cost of letting a theology trump scripture. Owen ended up in nonsense land on this issue. Let me turn to another writer who said the same sort of thing as Owen, but did so in a far more accessible manner, Matthew Henry. Although he used a Christian church, Henry was, of course, speaking of a gospel church. Like Owen, grievously confusing the establishment of the nation of Israel with the foundation of the church, Henry claimed that the Jewish church began at Mount Sinai. Commenting on Acts 2, he spoke of the giving of the law upon Mount Sinai, whence the incorporating of the Jewish church was to be dated. Commenting on Acts 7, he declared, they, that is the Jews, are ready to look upon him, that is Stephen, as an apostate from the Jewish church, and an enemy to them. But let us see what this is to Stephen's case. They had charged him as a blasphemer of God, and an apostate from the Jewish church. Therefore he shows that he is a son of Abraham, and values himself upon his being able to say, Our father Abraham and that he is a faithful worshipper of the God of Abraham, whom therefore he here calls the God of glory. He also shows that he owns divine revelation, and that particularly by which the Jewish church was founded and incorporated. But also that they, that is the Jews he was addressing, might consider that what they were now doing against the Christian church in its infancy was as impious and unjust and would be in the issue as fruitless and ineffectual as that was which the Egyptians did against the Jewish church in its infancy. And commenting on Acts 15, many of the Jews who embraced the faith of Christ yet continued very zealous for the law. They knew the law was from God, and its authority was sacred, valued it for its antiquity, have been bred up in the observance of it, and it is probable have been often devoutly affected in their attendance on these observances. They therefore kept them up after they were by baptism admitted into the Christian church. In a few years the mistake would be effectually rectified by the destruction of the temple and the total dissolution of the Jewish church by which the observance of the Mosaic ritual would become utterly impracticable. In this way, covenant theologians, on the basis of their philosophical covenant system, fly in the face of the fact that Israel was a nation, not the church. What is more, they disregard the fact that the overwhelming majority of the people of Israel were unregenerate. If not, they use that fact to bolster their view which inevitably follows in the wake of infant baptism, and talk of churches comprising the regenerate and unregenerate. Whichever it is, they end up in an unscriptural cul-de-sac. The scriptural position could not be more explicit. Only the regenerate can be part of the ecclesia. Regeneration is the absolute minimum qualification for membership. As for Israel... While there was a spiritual remnant in the nation, see, for example, Romans 9 to 11, in no sense was every Israelite regenerate. In any case, no nation has ever been a church. Israel in the Old Covenant was not, 
The church was not founded until Christ brought in the new covenant. But there it is. Covenant theologians speak of Israel as a church, the Jewish church. And this, as I have said, carries a huge price tag, infant baptism being not the least of it. Infant baptism has brought immense, not to say eternal, damage to many. And infant baptism is a direct consequence of covenant theology with its view that Israel and believers form one continuous body, being merely two manifestations of one church belonging to different administrations. I leave the question there, but in my booklet with the same title as this article, I take all this a little further in two respects. First, I show how the concept of a gospel church plays into infant baptism. Having done that, secondly, I say a little more about the question of mixed churches, churches made up of the regenerate and regenerate.